Good evening and uh, welcome everyone to this third episode of the Late Night Conference. My name is Wilhelm Haag and I'm your host tonight. And I do apologize for the slightly inferior camera work tonight. Uh, I have to quarantine, I couldn't go to the hairdressers and uh, we can't use our usual fancy setup in the lab. Uh, um, I hope you uh, joined us previously and you enjoyed last month's episode on the physics of life. Uh, I myself, I'm still very much intrigued by Professor Walker's definition of life in relation to the physics of information. Uh, today, though, we will take a more molecular view and we'll take our next step in the exploration of the possible origins of life. And in particular, we want to look at the transition from chemistry to biology. What are the key ingredients for a living system? Maybe the system has the potential to grow or the ability to divide. And if we talk, of course, about current living cells and we think about synthesis, growth, replication, division, and we think about a molecular scale, then we have, of course, the mighty engine in every one of our cells, the ribosome, which is a giant RNA machine. And that brings me to the idea of an RNA world, which was first proposed in the 1960s by Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel. Uh, but tonight, we have one of the world's leading scientists working on protocells and RNA world, Professor Jack Shostak. Jack Shostak is professor of genetics, as well as professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Harvard University. And he is an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, Jack trained as a cell biologist with undergraduate studies at McGill University and a PhD in biochemistry from Cornell. And much of his early research was on genetics and the structure of the chromosomes, and especially the structure of telomeres. And for this work, he was awarded the 2008 Heineken Prize and the 2009 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. But we are not going to talk about telomeres today. We're going to talk about RNA. And I must say, even in the time that he received the Nobel Prize, Jack had already refocused most of his research on RNA. Already in the 1990s, his lab was the first to discover RNA aptomers and used in vitro evolution of RNA to discover RNA molecules with catalytic activity. And more recently, he has made enormous contributions to the prebiotic synthesis of RNA enzymes that could be the precursors to those important ribosome machines that I mentioned earlier. So, Everyone, tonight we have a highly accomplished biochemist who is succeeding in synthesizing molecules of startling complexity using only prebiotic reagents. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a very exciting evening. Before we start, please let me remind you that we are looking for interesting questions from you, our audience. They can be on anything from the specifics of the science that you will hear tonight or to some career advice. Yes, I guess we all want to know how, you win, how to win a Nobel Prize, but your questions can be more modest as well. Um, just be sure to post them in the uh, live chat. Uh, and also please remember to like the video and subscribe to our channel. Click the bell so you will get notified for our next episodes. So with that, we are ready to start. Jack, the Zoom is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, very uh, um, happy to be here and glad to be uh, talking to everyone uh, uh, this evening. So, uh, what you can see, uh, sorry, uh, on the first slide here in the background image is our view of what we think uh, of as a highly simplified primordial cell or protocell much simpler than anything, any living system that currently exists on, on the Earth. And so what we're trying to understand is how something like this, uh, a protocell with a simple membrane and small bits of genetic material on the inside, how something like that could emerge uh, from the chemistry that was going on when our planet was much, much younger than it is now. And also how structures like this could start to evolve into uh, cells with greater complexity, ultimately uh, giving rise to uh, the life that we see all, all around us. But 
so there are many, many, many different aspects of this whole process. And, and so I only want to describe one sort of small uh, scientific story um, in, this, in this talk. Uh, but I also want to begin uh, with, with some, some background, some thoughts about you know, why, why this is uh, interesting. And um, you know, the question of the origin of life or sort of how, more generally how, how we got here it is obviously a really long-standing question. People have been interested in it for a long, long time. And you know, I always wondered why why has it been such a hard problem to address? You know, what's what's taken so long <laughs> for us to get to even the 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 current state of our of our understanding? Uh, and so, so I think one one factor. Um, uh, basically, I think there are sort of conceptual barriers that are uh, harder to overcome. It's harder to change our way of thinking about some of these problems than it is to actually do the experiments to test ideas, which uh, I think often turn out to be quite straightforward. So uh, just as an example, if you look at any modern cell, it's unbelievably complex, right? There are thousands of moving parts. There are all these sophisticated protein catalysts. Uh, the genetic information isn't like little fragments like you see in this image, but you know, genomes that are typically millions or billions of nucleotides long. Jack, I'm just interrupting because I'm not sure your slides are progressing. No, I'm still on the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I, I do apologize. I'm background <laughs> talking about this. Um, and, and so thinking about what an earlier, simpler structure would look like, I think has, has taken a while. And um, for example, the, the model that you see here actually came out of a lot of arguments at origin of life conferences with people from different points of view. So there were people like uh, Pierluigi Luisi who were thinking only about compartments uh, and thought that was the most relevant to the origin of life. And people like me with a background in genetics, thinking only about the nucleic acids and heredity and other people thinking only about metabolism. And, and it took a while for us in, in, in these discussions to, to sort of merge these ideas and, and come up with uh, what I think are testable models for what simple cells might have looked like. I think on the other side of this, something that's really developed over the last couple of decades is the idea that life might be really common because after all, now we know through the efforts of our friends in astronomy that there are uh, you know, planets around almost all stars. So in our galaxy alone, there will be billions of planets and we don't know how many, but some large number of Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars. And of course, we all want to know whether life might exist out there, uh, which if the origin of life is something that's relatively easy, um, that could certainly be the case. Life might be everywhere in the universe. But if it's a really hard process, if there are bottlenecks in the chemistry or the geology or in things that happen to planets, life might be incredibly rare. We could be the only place in the universe that has life. And, and so one of the things that actually makes this a really fun field to be in is, is getting to talk to people from different fields like astronomy and geology and, and you know, trying to uh, you know, think about early planets and the environments that uh, were there and, and try to integrate our view of, of chemistry with, uh, with, with the relevant in, environments. And so one way that we actually do that uh, is by taking people from different backgrounds. We go on uh, in, our, in our origins program here at Harvard, and we go on field trips. And uh, so in this image, you can see three uh, graduate students in our origins uh, program. Uh, Zoe over here is an astronomy uh, student. Uh, Yaya is an earth and planetary sciences student. And Lydia is a student in my lab uh, who is in chemistry. And all of us are trying to go out and 
uh, look at environments um, that will teach us something about what the early Earth might have been like, or specific um, places on the early Earth. And so Yellowstone is a remarkable place uh, to go. It's very uh, a volcanic uh, environment. You see all kinds of things that are, are, you know, we know about, but it's it's different when you actually see environments like this, and you see the the temperature gradients. You see pools that are only meters apart that are totally different in their chemistry and their, their acidity. Some are alkaline, uh, some smell like hydrogen sulfide, others are, are bubbling with CO2. So the, the diversity of, of environments is, is remarkable. And this, so it's, it's a very educational um, thing to do. It helps us to put our chemistry work in, in context. Uh, here's another example just showing how, how solutions can flow from one environment uh, to another. And, and here, of course, they would be subject to uh, uh, irradiation from, from the sun and on the early Earth that would have meant a lot of ultraviolet uh, radiation. Uh, one way we know that is, is um, from geology like this, this is a place in, in, in Western Australia where you see uh, uh, what's left of kilometers of precipitated iron oxides. And this is just one of the lines of evidence that the early earth was essentially anoxic. The atmosphere had a, a virtually zero free oxygen because any oxygen that was developed by either chemical or photosynthetic processes uh, reacted with uh, ferrous iron and precipitated uh, these insoluble iron uh, minerals. Okay, so these kinds of things are very helpful in trying to uh, visualize aspects of the early environment. So just as an overview, uh, this is kind of a rough timeline modified from a review by Jerry Joyce. So we know pretty much exactly when the early earth uh, formed. And after the moon forming impact, it took some maybe 100 million years plus or minus to cool down enough to have water, liquid water on the surface, which we think is a key aspect of doing the kinds of chemistry that would lead to biological building blocks. There's a period of an unknown length of time in which uh, small feedstock molecules like cyanide and formaldehyde other related molecules would start to assemble with each other to make increasingly complex intermediates, which somehow assembled into short RNA molecules, we think, which then could have assembled further, probably in the context of evolving protocells to generate RNA structures that can act as catalysts. Uh, we think one of those catalysts eventually allowed the synthesis of peptides and then the emergence of translation and ultimately therefore giving rise to early uh, to, to all the diversity of modern life. So there's, there's almost nothing left of this very early period in the Earth's history. And so to learn about this, we either have to deduce backwards from modern life to what must have come before or work forwards from the underlying chemistry. And hopefully we can meet in the middle and understand a continuous pathway. And I, I just wanted to make one comment about that because people often ask, you know, is, is, is working on the origin of life, is it even really science? Because after all, we can't go back and actually see what really happened. But what we can do and what the real goal of work in this field is, is to try to work out plausible, you know, reasonable, self-consistent pathways that go all the way from the beginning, the simplest beginnings up to modern complexity. And you can learn a lot by that. And of course, you can learn a lot of things that don't work. And that narrows down the kind of branching pathways. And we hope that eventually we'll be left with at least one continuous reasonable pathway that could provide a potential explanation for how life emerged. I think actually it would be great. And I think it's very likely that there'll be multiple pathways, at least for certain steps along the way. 
Uh, but this is this is the kind of thing that we're really trying to figure out, not not the impossible task of knowing exactly what happened at every step. Okay. So uh, as Willem uh, mentioned, all modern cells uh, use this huge macromolecular uh, machine to make proteins. It's basically an RNA machine. The gray squiggles are, are a part of the RNA molecules that make up the ribosome. And the gold colored squiggles mostly around the periphery are proteins. But the place in the middle of the machine where proteins are actually made is where these, these little green splotches are. And it's all RNA around there. So what we've learned from the structure of the ribosome is that RNA makes proteins. All the proteins in our bodies and in every living cell on Earth is made in this way by RNA. And so logically, the only conclusion that you can reasonably uh, draw is that RNA was around first. And RNA uh, eventually evolved the ability to make probably first simple peptides and then more complex proteins. But if RNA was first and we're left with a view of primitive cells based on an RNA genome and RNA catalysts, then the question becomes how did, how did chemistry of small molecules give rise to, to RNA molecules that could replicate and, and do interesting kinds of catalysis. And so that in itself is a very long standing problem. People have been trying to understand how RNA could replicate before there were enzymes, even RNA enzymes to catalyze those reactions. And so I'm just going to try to show you a, a, a little uh, video animation that was made a while ago by Janet Iwasa in my lab, showing what we are trying to understand. And the idea is that you have an RNA template floating around in a very rich chemical environment filled with activated nucleotides that will find their partners by base pairing and then spontaneously click together to build up a complementary strand. Okay, so it's very easy to look at that. It's essentially a a moving drawing, but what's what's the real chemistry that could do that? And that's, as I said, is a very long standing problem. And a lot of the early work was done by the, the, the father of this, this part of prebiotic chemistry, the late Leslie Orgel. And I just wanted to show as an example uh, what I think one of Leslie's major contributions was in, in overcoming one of the conceptual barriers to thinking about these early processes. And, and that barrier is that we're used to thinking about how this works in biology. So at the top, you see nucleoside triphosphates, which are the universal biological substrates for uh, polymerizing RNA and DNA. But these molecules, these substrates only work if you have fantastic catalysts like highly evolved polymerases. And if we're trying to understand how things got started, before we had those polymerases, these molecules wouldn't work. Okay? So you have to think about alternatives. And uh, Leslie and his colleagues and students explored a large number of possibilities. And they come up, came up with molecules like these phosphorimidazolides, which are much more reactive and start to polymerize uh, spontaneously. So, we got involved in this uh, several years ago. And, and in order to try to make that chemistry work better, we focused for quite a while, and actually we're still largely focused on understanding the underlying mechanism of that chemical reaction. And so in this slide, I just wanna walk you through one totally surprising uh, result that came out of the studies of a graduate student in the lab, Travis Walton. So for decades, people assumed that this chemical RNA copying would work the same way that the elongation of a strand in biology works, which is that you have a, a growing strand, a primer, that would react with one incoming nucleotide. And the three prime hydroxyl of at the end of the primer would attack the adjacent phosphate of the incoming monomer, the primer would grow by one base and the leaving group would be kicked out. And it turned out 
that the more we tried to look at that, the less, I mean, it just turned out to be wrong. And ultimately what Travis figured out is that it doesn't work that way at all. And in fact, what happens uh, is shown over here on the right-hand side. Uh, two of these activated phosphorimidazolide types of nucleotides can react with each other to make this covalent intermediate. This is a five prime, five prime imidazolium bridged dinucleotide. Um, nothing like this had ever been seen or thought of uh, before. It was a total surprise. But this is an obligate intermediate. And the way that it works is that these things form either in solution or on the template. And they can bind to the template by making two Watson Crick base pairs. So they bind much better than monomers. And then this phosphoimidazolium phospho bridge is a highly pre-organized structure. It's both chemically reactive and geometrically poised to react so that the three prime hydroxyl at the end of the growing strand attacks the adjacent phosphate, just like we always thought. But now the leaving group is the whole activated nucleotide. So the primer reacts with a dinucleotide, grows by one nucleotide, and kicks out another nucleotide. And then the cycle repeats itself. And um, just to make that a little more convincing than a diagram, it turns out we can actually see this chemistry happening in a series of crystal structures. Um, and this is work that was done by Wen Zhang when he was a postdoc in the lab. And what you're seeing here is the, the nucleobase up in the top left corner in each of the three panels is the end of the primer. Here's the three prime hydroxyl at the very end that has to attack the incoming phosphate. Here are two activated monomers bound to a template. And the template is off the top of the screen. You can see these two monomers are bound. They're, they turn out they're bound by watson crick base pairing, but their leaving groups are just waving around. So we don't really see them in the crystal structure. But if you let the crystal sit around for about an hour, you'll see that the pattern of electron density changes. And now we see the imidazolium bridge joining these two nucleotides together. And when that happens, the geometry is subtly shifted so that now the three prime hydroxyl is poised to attack the adjacent phosphate, kick out the leaving group. And if you let this complex sit around even longer, now you see new electron density uh, here between the incoming monomer and the primer. So this is the formation of a new phosphodiester bond. So we can actually see the whole process happening, which has been uh, very uh, convincing and, and gratifying um, in the, we now understand to a certain level what's actually going on. There still is a lot to learn. Um, for example, there's a catalytic metal ion that's essential for, for increasing the rate of this reaction, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how that works. Um, uh, it turns out, and I'm going to show you an example, that RNA is much better at doing this than almost anything else. And so we think now that we understand some of the reasons for that, but there's still more, more to do there. So something that we thought was simple turned out to work in a different way um, than, than we thought for many years, but it's, it's, it's been really uh, interesting and fun to see this uh, get figured out. Okay, so that it does not solve uh, all of the problems, of course, of getting to the RNA world. And one of the biggest challenges uh, was pointed out by Leslie Orgel and Jerry Joyce uh, almost 30 years ago in a famous quote uh, where they were uh, essentially mocking uh, uh, molecular biologists for this, uh, what they called the molecular biologist dream of getting to the RNA world with some little prebiotic pool that was filled with a concentrated solution of pure beta D ribonucleotides. And, and, and that, that even then was just obviously um, uh, not a, a reasonable scenario. Um, because prebiotic chemistry doesn't have the specificity that enzyme catalyzed metabolism has. And, and so it, it's almost inevitable that prebiotic synthesis will give us a mixture of different kinds of nucleotides. 
And then the question is, how would you get RNA out of such a, a, a messy mixture? Um, so, so in this diagram, I'm trying to illustrate that by showing different kinds of, say, ribonucleotides mixed in with other things that would be made, we think, at, in, at the same time, uh, where with different sugars like arabinonucleotides or four carbon threonucleotides or deoxynucleotides, the building blocks of DNA. And if all these things are mixed together, and they start to condense with each other randomly to make short oligos. These oligos would be incredibly heterogeneous. And it seems unlikely that they would be able to fold up and, and, and make more complex three-dimensional structures that could do anything useful. So how do you get something more homogeneous out of this kind of primordial heterogeneity? And, and I should say that, uh, so I'm gonna tell you just one a uh, very specific story that we've worked on, but uh, Ram Krishnamurthy has also worked on this problem uh, and has come up with some different ways uh, of solving it. So there are probably a lot of factors that contribute to the solution. Uh, and I just want to try to show you one, one thing that we think might have helped. Okay, so if we think about this in a little bit more chemical detail, we can look at uh, the basic nucleic acid structure where you have um, informational units, the nucleobases on the right-hand side here. And so in modern RNA, that would be A, G, C, and U. But in more primordial RNA, there might be variations like thionucleotides or inosine or 8-oxopurines or many other variations. On the, the backbone is a sugar phosphate backbone. And so in modern RNA, it's ribose, this is sugar, in DNA, it's deoxyribose. But there could be other sugars like arabinose here, where the two prime hydroxyl is up, four carbon sugars like threos. And again, there are many variations that are potentially, you know, could have existed. And the connectivity can also vary. And I'm showing here a standard 3-5 connection, but also there could have been 2-5 connections like you see here. There could have been pyrophosphate linkages, amino acid bridge linkages, again, all kinds of variation in all parts of this structure. So primitive RNA might have been really messy. And so how do we get out from a mess to something that's more homogeneous and more useful in the sense of being more evolvable? So I'm going to, say, as I said, give you one example. And uh, one example of an alternative to standard ribonucleotides that we think would have been made at the same time are arabinonucleotides, where the sugar is arabinose. So why do we think that those nucleotides would have been around? And the answer comes from uh, a, a pathway. So this, this pathway actually has old roots, but I'm just showing you part that was um, Worked, has been worked out a lot in the Sutherland lab in the last decade or so. And so there are two, two steps where we take a, a very simple two carbon sugar, allow it to react with cyanamide, close relative of cyanide. And under the right conditions, they react almost quantitatively to make this simple heterocycle to amino oxazole. And then you come in in a second step with the three carbon sugar, glyceraldehyde, and that reacts to make amino oxazolines, which are shown over here. And they can form, in particular, two stereoisomers. So if this new ring is down, this is the ribose amino oxazoline. If it's up, it's the arabinose. And in two or three subsequent steps, the RAO can be trans transformed into ribonucleotides, and the AAO can be transformed into arabinonucleotides. And those steps are highly parallel. So if you make one, it's likely that you'll make the other. OK, and just, just to reiterate, the difference is only in the stereochemistry of this hydroxyl, down for RNA, up for ANA, or arabinonucleosides. OK, so in order to try to understand what would happen if both of these nucleotides were around in a primordial system. We, what we do is we make 
all of these variations. So we made uh, error G as well as ribo G and put it into a, a simple model system for template copying. And so in this uh, experimental system, we have a fluorescently labeled RNA primer bound to an RNA template. We have in this particular experiment, an incoming mononucleotide and it's sandwiched between the primer and a downstream activated uh, RNA trinucleotide, a helper, which makes the chemistry more efficient. And we can have the incoming nucleotide be either the standard uh, ribo G or the arabino G. And what we see experimentally is that if the incoming monomer is a ribonucleotide, the primer grows by one pretty quickly and less than finished by half an hour. If it's the incoming nucleotide is an error G, then it takes uh, basically a day for the reaction to be completed. So it's more than 10 times slower. So in a competitive situation, uh, RNA would win. And we did show that by doing um, competition experiments. So this was all work of Chris Kim, uh, a graduate student in the lab. Now, even though the reaction is slower, sometimes it works. And so that means you would end up with primers now that end in an error nucleotide. So what would happen then? So we do more experiments to test that out. And if the primer ends in a standard RNA nucleotide, subsequent extension, of course, is relatively fast. If it ends in an arabino nucleotide, it's really slow. This is, uh, I mean, it's basically a chain terminator. So this is telling us that era nucleotides are not going to, uh, certainly not going to win out. And in fact, they'll probably be filtered out because they just don't react well. Of course, when we see a result like this, we want to understand why this is happening. What, why does this small difference in the position of a hydroxyl that's not even the hydroxyl that's reacting, why does it have such a big effect? And uh, so what we, usually try to do is get crystal structures, look at conformations, and see if there's some structural explanation for the difference. And so uh, this is, again, crystal structures made by, uh, done, solved by Wen Zhang. And what we see is if the, if the RNA strand that's acting as a primer is an arabino G instead of ribo G, the three prime hydroxyl is much further away, about two angstroms further away, from the phosphate that it has to attack to grow uh, than in the case of RNA. Interestingly, the two prime hydroxyl is, is not so badly positioned, but it's buried in the structure and we think that the catalytic metal ion can't reach it. So this gives us at least a, a, a structural rationale for why RNA works in this reaction and that plausible competitor ANA doesn't work. Now, the third place arabinonucleotides could end up, of course, is in the template strand, those initially randomly assembled uh, uh, strands. And here, the results are just the opposite. It's quite interesting that uh, era or ribonucleotides in the strand that's going to be copied, they both work fine. The era is a little bit slower. Uh, in this case, maybe five times, six times slower if it's A. Uh, but basically, the, the result is you can copy over this heterogeneity in the template uh, by making RNA, but not by making ANA. So we've looked at this for lots of different uh, variations on the structure of ribonucleotides. And basically, the answer is that RNA always wins. RNA in, in, in its structure and reactivity seems to be a kind of privileged polymer that's just better at doing copy and chemistry. And so that's led to this model where we start off with a heterogeneous mixture. These, these monomers condense into short oligos that are, again, very heterogeneous. But they can base pair by Watson-Crick base pairing every now and then. Their sequences are also random. And when this happens and primer extension can occur, it's going to be RNA that gets made. And so if you keep doing this and keep cycling these complexes, eventually you make more and more RNA-like, more and more homogeneous RNA-like oligos. And we think this is a much better starting point for evolution and the development of RNA-based cells. And so it's a kind of 
path into the RNA world. Okay, um, all of the work that I talked about and tons of work I didn't talk, have time to talk about has been done by fantastic uh, students in the lab. Uh, this is a panel of graduate students. The top ones are all still in the lab. Uh, and also Alex is working on translation. Uh, these guys have uh, done great work and moved on to different things. Uh, there's also been uh, many fantastic uh, postdocs who've contributed to this work. So I wanna thank all of them. And uh, so at this point, uh, I'm happy to stop and take questions on any of the science or anything else people might want to talk about. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jack, uh, for a very impressive uh, piece of chemistry there. Because when I was thinking about how to summarize it, uh, you, you started off in a way saying, looking at the ribosome and saying, the, the RNA uh, has to have many of the answers to uh, a possible origin of life. It has, has to uh, play a key role. Uh, ben, but then when you start thinking about the origin of the RNA molecule, and you start thinking about this messy pool, uh, and I was thinking about all the chemists who uh, try so hard on making the exactly right sort of building block and, and trying to come up with all this special chemistry to make ribose, for example, or to make this particular sort of selectivity of the three, five coupling. Uh, um, and it is really nice to see that in the end, we chemists don't have to make so many efforts because the chemistry will help us in a way. We, it, it, it's sort of self-selecting and, and it will automatically select kinetically also in a system that will eventually have all the right characteristics to come together. Right? So, so I, I think there's some hope for us synthetic chemists to, uh, to make pr progress there. So, so that is really very nice, uh, uh, nice part of your story tonight. So, so thank you for that. Uh, yeah, um, you. And I, I think both of these things and, and other aspects as well come in. Right, so there's some selectivity in making the building blocks of RNA, but then there are these other factors that overcome any residual mass. Uh, yes, yeah, it's all part of the story. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, there's a question related to this from Felina Boss, who uh, would like to ask whether the ribo, rabino, trio, the oxynucleotides, um, which could all have been early contenders. Uh, whether they can still be found in the early layers of the earth. Uh, so is there any, maybe, is there a fossil out there? Is there any research performed on this? Yeah, unfortunately, um, all of the, the, the remnants of Earth's early geology have basically been lost by plate tectonics and subduction. So there's no geological place really to, to look for remnants from that time. The earliest that we can go back really and look at, at fossils of primitive life is 3.5 to maybe 3.8 uh, billion years ago. And we think this happened even earlier than that. And uh, you know, if you look at, at modern life and try to find remnants or fossils of earlier times, you don't see anything that's informative about be things from before RNA. What you do see though, there are some clues. So we see, for example, RNA molecules like riboswitches that uh, bind small molecules and play regulatory roles. So that tells you that RNA-based cells in the RNA world could have had quite sophisticated regulatory mechanisms. Mm -hmm. If you look at the cofactors that are involved in so much of enzymatic catalysis. Many of them are modified nucleotides. Again, hinting back to, to an yes. RNA world yeah. origin. So that's kind of what we have to look yeah. at. Now on Mars, actually- Yeah, I was different. going to mention that. I thought you were going to say that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there we do have the early geology. And, and in fact, some very exciting aspects of that are going to be explored in the next few months by the Perseverance uh, rover. Even there, though, I think uh, probably the most that we can hope for is to see remnants of organic chemistry, maybe chemistry that led up to early life, if we're lucky. It, it's hard to know how processed 
it, it, would, be after it would be interesting to see that messy pool of nucleotides though. Yeah, I, it would be fantastic. But I, I think these molecules are, are probably not gonna last 4 billion years, even on a cold, dry place like Mars. Uh, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, yeah. for the return mission, I guess. Uh, yeah. um, I have a couple of other questions that uh, are coming up. Uh, um, Martin Feiters uh, would like to know uh, which type of metal is involved in the phosphoimidazole nucleotide polymerization, whether it's magnesium or zinc? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So we typically use magnesium in, in our experiments. Um, and so the nice thing about magnesium is it's a relatively abundant uh, element. It would be common, I think, in many of the reasonable environments. On the other hand, there are metals, other divalent cations like zinc uh, or manganese that are interesting and which could be enriched in local environments. And so we, we do look at those as well. Uh, of course, Iron itself, ferrous iron, uh, also works in catalyzing this chemistry, um, but it seems to be even better at degrading RNA. So we're not yes. that <laughs> 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 uh, iron is, is the catalyst. Uh, I have another question from Pete Paul, uh, and this is more on the very fundamental role of RNA as a self-replicating uh, or potentially self-replicating molecule. Uh, he would like to know, is did life start from autocatalytic cycles catalyzed by metals? And I, I assuming here that the metals are involved in the um, in the RNA molecules. So is there, uh, are these models good evidence for a metabolism first? Well, uh, I don't know, that might be a question that's actually better directed at, uh, at you, Bella. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you could view RNA self-replication as a kind of autocatalytic uh, cycle catalyzed by magnesium, uh, potentially. Um, but whether there are simpler autocatalytic cycles that helped to give rise uh, to nucleotides, I think, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, but we're, you know, that's a, a very uh, current area of research. And of course, if there were autocatalytic cycles that gave rise to precursors of nucleotides or lipids or anything useful, that, that would be a very important part of the story. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to add to that in general. I think catalysis is going to be crucial. So, so I think for, and, and I think you show that in uh, many of your uh, chemistries as well. I think in the end, you cannot rely on just chemical reactions to happen that are not catalyzed. So I think the combinations of catalysts and the reactions that you had in earlier must have been a, a crucial pair to, to combine, yeah. to lead to all kinds of st stuff. I think autocatalysis is part thereof, but I think all the other catalysis is, is very important too. Yeah, so we see like metal ion catalysis is fundamental here. Yeah. Uh, in some of the earlier steps, uh, phosphate as an acid-base catalyst is, is critical. Um, so those are very, very simple catalysts. And, and I think a key question is whether there are perhaps somewhat more complex catalysts that play essential roles or, or speed things up at uh, limiting steps in the process. So again, we need to find out. Um, I have a question from Lieke who would like to know, and, and, and I don't know her background, but she says, could simple chance cause evolution? Uh, so when a chemical reaction happens millions of times, a functional combination is bound to happen. Um, well, I think uh, given your background in evolution, you probably can answer this question. Then. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, let's see. So, so the process of evolution in, in the sense of Darwinian evolution requires replication and variation that, you know, in the sense of mutation, that's where chance comes into it, right? Mutations uh, arise through um, essentially deterministic chemical pathways, but what mutation arises where in a particular cell or strand of RNA is, is essentially random. So it's that random variation occurring in a population that gives rise to new sequences that uh, 
you know, usually are not helpful, but every now and then there's a good mutation and that can uh, do something helpful for the cell that it's in. That cell has a better chance of surviving or going on to reproduce. And so it will eventually take over the population. So, so there's a role for chance, but the chance uh, events on a population can actually have deterministic uh, outcomes. Um, so for example, in some of our molecular evolution experiments, we see the same RNA motifs, three-dimensional structural motifs arising again and again, simply because they're the simplest way of doing something. Um, so the interplay between chance and necessity is a very interesting thing to think about. Thank you. I think that probably uh, answers the question of Lika. I have another question from Dance Productions. Uh, the first question is, do you think that the origin of life field is past its prime or only getting started? <laughs> I actually think that we're, we're at one of the most exciting stage that it's ever been at. I think the pace of progress is, is picking up and you know, every year there are uh, just amazing, surprising new discoveries. Um, and, and yet, you know, there's still a lot out there to discover. So I think we're at a, a really great time in the field. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, and what is your personal opinion? Do you think perseverance will find signs of life on Mars? Which is a very broadly asked question, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it may be the next generation or two of rovers that uh, have more advanced capabilities that will have even even better chances. So to find extant life, I think it's pretty clear that we'll have to drill down uh, below the surface uh, and into aquifers. Um, now, perseverance could find organic chemistry that is really interesting in thinking about the origin of life. There are specific things that, that we're on the lookout for. Um, but I, I, I think it's going to be a step, a step on the pathway. We, we may see some signs of residual chemistry, minerals, certain compounds we're on the lookout for that that might suggest that the stage was being set for life, but I don't think we'll find definitive evidence mm -hmm. for um, life before or now from perseverance. Yeah, I guess at some point the borderline between finding those molecules that are definitely sort of uh, a sign of life or definitely a sign of chemistry it might be difficult to assign that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, Thomas Lockhart had another question, and he would like to ask you what will be, or what has been, uh, the biggest breakthrough discovery into origin of life research? Oh, wow. Uh, I, I mean, just my personal opinion is that um, some of the advances from the Sutherland lab in the UK that explain how to make nucleotides in a series of steps that, that have high yields and, and reasonable reaction conditions, I think has been a real breakthrough. Um, but yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot that's happened, but I think learning more about how to make the building blocks has really been a critical aspect. I think one of the exciting things that's happening to the field now is, is bringing in geologists, planetary scientists, to try to understand more about relevant environments. That's been very exciting as well. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I have another question from Matan, uh, who would like to know, did early peptides give a selection pressure for certain RNA structures to survive better than others? So this is the interplay, I guess, when you look at the yeah. picture of the ribosome, where you have, of course, proteins and RNA together. Was there maybe an early connection already? Yeah, I, I think that that's a really interesting uh, uh, question and subject. Uh, the, the, the difficulty that I have with that is if before the origin of coded peptide synthesis, which is a really complex 
complex process and clearly the result of a long period of evolution. So before coded peptide synthesis, if peptides were generated, which they would have been, making peptides is chemically easy, they presumably would have been essentially random with, you know, sequences determined by whichever amino acids were around. Um, but then if there's a highly specific sequence that's good at stabilizing a particular RNA sequence, how would you ever get enough of it? And, and how would more of the right peptide be made? And I think those are open questions. So we, uh, you know, uh, there has to have been some pathway of getting to one helping the other. So there has been how, some feedback uh, in yeah. two, two different directions. So. Yeah, how that happened is, is I think a really important open question. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, I think. Uh, um, as for the coded peptides, uh, uh, synthesis would that not also coming back to the earlier question one of the biggest breakthroughs i guess in in future research on origins of life uh, because do you think it has to be sort of before the origin of life that you have this peptide coded peptide sequence uh, coded peptide synthesis my my feeling is that coded peptide synthesis was the result of a long evolutionary sequence of events that's um, by far from a universally held uh, point of view. <laughs> so uh, John Sutherland in particular, among many others, has, has searched for years for some inherent stereoelectronic uh, reason for, um, for, for the origin of coding mm -hmm. in, in like some relationship between codons and amino acids. Um, and uh, it hasn't been found yet, but he always has new ideas. And you know, maybe, maybe <laughs> there is, there, maybe yes. there is uh, some some link there that uh, mm -hmm. remains to be discovered. Um, Stephanie Linskens would like to know what would be the best advice you would give to career-wise to young biologists. Uh, well, I, I think you know, if you're going to go into science. It, um, you know, there are so many interesting problems. If, if you're really thinking about going into to re a research career, I think the most important thing is to find something that really grabs you, some question, uh, you know, that, that you just are driven to, to understand, to solve. Um, because, you know, do, doing science, doing research is hard. Most things you do don't work. So you, you have to find something that really grabs you and drives you and makes you stick with it. Um, uh, yeah, um, I guess also you still need a little bit of help, of course, of people who will be willing yeah. to support you, I guess, also um, to, to get you onto that career uh, uh, and, and support you long enough to, to, to make you settled. Um, ha have there been particular people or individuals uh, who have been um, important in your course, uh, or, or in, during the course of your career, uh, where you really said, well, that was an eye opener that, that helped me go further? Sure, you know, if, I, I think, you know, if you look at anybody's career, you'll find people who are important. So yeah, for me, I go all the way back to having a really fantastic uh, biology teacher in high school who got me really interested in that kind of science. Um, when I was uh, an undergrad at, at uh, McGill, I, uh, uh, I, I sort of went around from, you know, worked briefly in a lot of different labs, but ended up in a really fantastic lab with a, a, a great PI. Um, and, and so having a, a kind of really early successful research experience got me hooked on science and made me stick with it. Um, give me one second. I yes. have, uh, <laughs> have to, uh, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, we, uh, I just have to tell someone that I, uh, I'll be uh, downstairs in a few minutes. Uh, sorry about this. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Well, I think we're we're close to wrapping up, uh, and um, um, perhaps. Uh, 
I guess um, one of the final questions, there's quite a few more questions that, that were coming in. I have to pick one, I think that you, you would say that this is a good, uh, good one for us to, uh, to sort of end on. Um, well, I think this is a really nice one. Uh, how soon do you think we'll be, be able to say whether there is life somewhere else in the universe? Uh, uh, and you might even be able, you might also say, well, I pass that on to some of my ne next speakers on the, uh, on the late night conference, of course, but we would like to have your, uh, your opinion today, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I really hope that uh, sometime within the next uh, 10 to 20 years, we might have some pretty convincing evidence. So, so what we're talking about here is, is basically a spectroscopy of the atmosphere yes. of exoplanets. Um, and, you know, the, the technology for building um, the right kinds of telescopes and detectors is advancing by leaps and bounds. Um, so it's going to be partly a matter of luck if, as to whether we can find a, a planet around a star that's close enough uh, to us and that has the right kind of planetary environment. Um, uh, so I, I think if we're really lucky, it could be 10 years, it might be 20, it might be 30. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Jake, I know you're, um, you're stressed for time. We have sort of had the pleasure to have you on our show tonight. Thank you very much for uh, joining us and for showing us some of the wonderful chemistry that is going on in your lab. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. This was, this was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. And I hope we have an opportunity to, to meet again at the uh, Simons meeting uh, sometime when this pandemic is over and we'll meet yes, again. Yes, uh, yes. That will be, be very nice. Again in person. Okay. 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 Good, right. good night and bye-bye. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Um, I think uh, that was it for tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the lecture tonight, uh, I would uh, uh, like to uh, sort of sort of thank Jack once more. He has already uh, left uh, for showing us how wonderful the uh, sort of fields of chemistry and biology can meet in this one special molecule, uh, which is called RNA. Um, and uh, with that, we're going to wrap up. I would uh, like to thank my team who made it possible that we are uh, sort of managed to do the uh, broadcast tonight when we are all at different places, uh, but it worked out really well in the end. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, I hope to see you next month when we have Lee Cronin uh, on the show. Uh, thank you all and good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>